You are listening to Something Rather Than Nothing. Creator and host, Ken Vellante. Editor and producer, Peter Bauer. This is Ken Vellante with Something Rather Than Nothing podcast and happy to welcome uh, Lauren Rhodes. And uh, Lauren uh is is an author um she's also served as an editor uh she has written uh the dangerous type uh, which is a science fiction uh, book uh wish you were here adventures in cemetery travel a book that i uh, noticed and really started to um look into what laura was writing uh morbid curiosity cures the blues which was a collection uh from from a magazine uh and also a new uh collection of stories uh coming out called unsafe words lauren rhodes wanted to welcome welcome you to the podcast it's it's a pleasure to have you here thanks so much for having me absolutely and 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 obviously with the, some of those titles um there's a few things for us to to chat about i i have a lot of uh curiosity and, and enjoyed uh your writing and your explorations but first of all what were you like when you were younger what were you like as a young human perennially curious creating what were you like i was a bookworm um my mom would drop me off at the library on saturday mornings and then she'd go to the grocery store and i would just roam and pick things off the shelves at random and just read anything that caught my eye and it kind of oh she 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 encouraged that she became a librarian while I was in high school and then I had the pleasure of going to work with her and just you know going through all the shelves wherever library she was assigned and you know it, books were everything to me as a kid and and once I finally was able to leave the farm and get out into the world, that curiosity has just fed me the rest of my life. So many questions. Yeah, yeah. And uh, well, that's obviously such a great, <laughs> such a great habit to have somebody uh, help you form. And, and I know myself. Um, as far as curiosity, I know when I'm when I'm in a library, it tends to to folks who love books and love libraries. It tends to be kind of a bit of an overwhelming experience and one where you you can truly get lost. And it sounds like you probably had that experience from from a very young age. Mm-hmm. I didn't grow up in bookstores. You know, it was unusual for us to have books of our own. My my folks had books, and we'd get books very occasionally, but this was, you know, back in the day before Borders or Barnes and Noble or, you know, large bookstores. And so the little town I grew up in didn't have a bookstore, still doesn't. And uh, the library just served that function. You know, you get a stack of books on Saturday, read them all week, take them back next Saturday, get another stack of books. It was, it was heaven. Yeah, I love talking about I love talking about books. But a general a general question to follow up from this overall, um, what type of what forms of art do you you know do you enjoy to consume in 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 and create overall? My tastes are pretty wide ranging. I I like uh, superhero movies and operas. I like audiobooks. I like geez going to see a play, pretty much anything. Um, I read mostly these days fantasy, science fiction, horror, and (laughs) book after book about cemeteries, strangely enough. But with the pandemic, I really miss browsing in bookstores and sitting in movie theaters. I mean, those two things, I, I didn't realize how important they were to me until I couldn't have them anymore. Yeah, I absolutely share that. I, I I agree. And it was like for me uh, with the pandemic, I was even something with the movie. It seemed like I'm a I'm a movie buff myself as well. And um, just when you're sitting around, it's like ah, well, I can just leave and go to the movies. And that's when I first realized it. You know, I was like, oh gosh, well that that option's cut off for a while. Yeah. You know, just 
just what do I do? Ah, let's go catch a movie. And um, I think there's been a lot of that experience, of course, where it's just, you know, just something you do. And then it's just kind of it's 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 cut out. Um, so in, you know, perusing uh, bookstores in, 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 you know, libraries, the, the search, right? Like the search for what you don't you don't know what you're looking for, but you yeah, find exactly. it. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Amazon is great if you know what you want. But if you don't know what you want and you want to be surprised by something, there's there's nothing like just roaming in a bookstore. And so uh, I ask a big question before we get into a little bit more about, um, you know, me asking specifically about some of the some of the works you've written. Um, I have a big question is uh, I wonder if you could take a stab at what is art? I love that. Um, for me, I think art is a celebration of the beauty of being human. Uh, that it's the it's a way that we define ourselves and look at our commonalities. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. The the common. Uh you know, common human experience, I think, um, mm -hmm. with, with, with art. Um, now let me ask you a question r related, related to art before we go into, you know, um, you know, science fiction and stuff, science fiction, horror has always suffered from a lower estimation. Uh, I don't know whether it's been its source as kind of pulp fiction or just not being part, you know, viewed, viewed a bit separately from, you know, real, uh, 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 fiction. Have you experienced that or do, do you feel that? And do you have any comments around how it seems science fiction and horror has always had to try to crawl uh, or, or claw for respectability? I know. I think it's changed a lot. When I first started writing science fiction, it was, it was unusual for, for women, especially to write it. And, um, you know, taking a creative writing class or something like that, I'd often be the only genre writer in the class. But I just, I lived in the real world. I didn't want to explore the real world in my imagination. I wanted to extrapolate, you know, what if humans were the minority in the galaxy? What if an angel and a succubus fell in love? You know, there, there are ways to twist reality a little bit and it means you can see it clearer it's kind of like using a magnifying glass uh, you could pick up on nuances that you wouldn't be able to see otherwise and you know I got bored 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 in creative writing in college where everybody was writing terrible roommate stories because you know none of us had any life experience and what else were you going to write about <laughs> so you know I wanted to write about you know, what if, what if your roommate was so awful that you had to kill them to get out of your lease? You know, that was a whole lot more interesting than <laughs> coming home from the bar, I guess. Uh, you know what? I, I took a creative writing class in college and I think those same stories were around me. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I hesitate to, to think that they're still writing stories like that, but. I don't know. I, I, Lauren, I, I think we, we I, I think they are. I think they are. But, um, <laughs> but, um, oh, I hope uh, not. And, and, and so, of course, you know, around around your writing, um, I, I, you know, uh, I, I, I love and enjoy uh, science fiction. Your dangerous, the dangerous type is very well executed. Um, you. you obviously have a, a, you know, a deep talent. Um uh, for writing and I enjoy your imagination going back to morbid curiosity cures cures the blues can you I mean this is a little bit self-indulgent for me but I think the listeners would be very interested as well can you tell the your story connected to getting those stories putting those stories together collecting those um, can you just give a little bit of background on that uh, iteration of yourself sure um well, I grew up on a farm. So when I went away to college, I met my husband at the University of Michigan. And he had gone to school in Davis, California, which is north of San Francisco. 
And it, all he said through the whole time we were in school was as soon as he graduated, he was going back to California. And I thought, well, you know, I've never been to California. Why not? That sounds like fun. So, you know, we came out here. I didn't know a soul. Uh, we ended up sort of by accident working for research publications. And that was back in oh, 1988. In, in 89, their book... Um, Modern Primitives came out, and that was the book that started making tattoos mainstream, tattoos and body piercings and uh, tribal design and all of that, all dates back to Modern Primitives. And I was, you know, straight off the farm right in the middle of all of that. Uh, and it, it was it was a huge education. Here were two people that were basically running a publishing industry out of their apartment and I thought wow you know if it's that easy I'm gonna publish things too and so I, I got to thinking well what would I what would I want to read what would I want to publish and I I never had any question in my head the magazine was going to be called Morbid Curiosity and it took kind of a couple of issues for it to settle into being true first-person confessional essays, uh, people telling, I don't know, stories about the, the worst things that ever happened to them or the most amazing things that ever happened to them or, you know, they had some terrible medical mystery that they had to solve or they saw a ghost or uh, were visited by a UFO, all kinds of crazy things. And I just, I left it real open-ended, you know, tell me, a story from your own life and use kind of the the tropes and the tools of fiction. I want to see dialogue. I want to see description, characterization and all of that. But it has to be true. And I just got the most amazing stories, the most incredible things. And, and the, she's the highlight of the whole experience for me was every May when the new issue came out, I would get the local contributors together and we do like an afternoon afternoon long uh, event where they get up and read their stories in front of an audience and the you know the events would be huge we'd have 100 people or 150 people jammed into a bookstore you know shoulder to shoulder sitting on the floor for hours just listening to these confessional stories so it was amazing but it got to the point where that was pretty much all I was doing, you know, one year to the next. It would take me a whole year to put an issue together. And, um, you know, I was getting tons of stories and I, you know, decisions were really hard. And it's hard when you, when you ask people for their deepest, darkest secrets, and then you have to say, you know, I'm sorry, I, I got six stories about suicide attempts this issue and I, I just can't publish yours I mean you know those people are fragile right but you you can't accept all those stories so it sure sure it got to the point where I just couldn't put the magazine out anymore and um, I approached a publisher and I said you know how about kind of uh, the highlights some of my favorite stories from the, the issues of the magazine and they said sure so that was how Morbid Curiosity Cures the Blues came about Long story short. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. And I'm and I'm and I'm sure. Um, well, could you could you let could you let the listeners know maybe if there's a particular story or like maybe a, a type of story, like something that's just kind of sticks out, you know, for you that that you tended should, to enjoy or just super curious. <laughs> I should turn that around. Do you have a favorite in the book? Oh, my goodness. Um <laughs> Because, you know, you it's know, like picking out my favorite child, right? So, well, you know, I, you know, here's the thing. Here's the thing I would say, um, at least topically, uh, and I guess I'm going to be more general than anything. Topically, I would say that there's something about living in Oregon and having spent time in southern Oregon and to see people are pretty tuned into curious, uh, strange things, right? UFO sightings in southern oregon like particular do hills do you have bigfoot there too 
Bigfoot, um, a huge cultural sensitivity towards the possibility of very strange things. So, mm-hmm. like my my, you know, I'm from the East Coast, but I know out here I can have I can pretty generally have an extended conversation about Bigfoot, UFO, and definitely ghosts. Ghosts are a little more universal, universal, mm-hmm. but here. Um, than most any other place, in particularly in Southern Oregon, with, um, with 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 the UFOs, I really enjoyed. I really enjoyed um, within the book anything related to ghosts and anything along the lines with aliens. I love those stories, and I love the the more you know. As much as I badmouth the real world, some of the really simple. Uh, reality-based stories. There's one by Dana Fredsty about dancing in a bikini bar. And, you know, she goes into it thinking, you know, I like to dance and I like to um, do flamenco and stuff like that. But then right. at her experiences as the evenings go on and getting up on stage, you know, it's not what she thought she was getting into. And You know, some of the women do that as a job. They're putting themselves through school. But she was just kind of doing it as a lark. And it wasn't as fun as she thought it was going to be. And there's another piece in there by um, Gravity Goldberg about going to a black mass in Oakland. And, you know, it's the the same sort of thing where she's just kind of curious about, you know, this was going on and she'll go check it out. And (laughs) wasn't exactly what she was expecting. Exactly. Hey, um, so let me before before we get before before we move on a tiny bit. Um, so tell me, and I've been curious about this ever since I saw the 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 book title. Like the title of what you were doing drew me in. So the title is extremely successful, right? So I look at it and said, I've always had a deep curiosity, morbid curiosity around. Uh, around these stories. So I was, I was an easy target for, you know, for that work. Excellent. But, but what do you think, what do you think as far as the, the psychology that you point into it, like the, the satisfaction or the feeling better or dropping into dark, strange stories in how that can be helpful. I mean, you must have some thoughts about that. I, I was wondering because for me, it, it was intuitive, the title, right? And I don't mm-hmm. think it'd be intuitive for everybody that morbid curiosity, you know, cures the blues or helps you along. What What are your thoughts just on the title itself and what reading stories like that does for the reader? Well, I think there's a lot to be said for catharsis, right? And for schadenfreude (laughs) you know that that you know these terrible things happened to these people and they survived you know that going in right because it's a first person story but wow are you glad that has not happened to you in your life you know as bad as things have been at least you didn't end up dancing in a bikini bar right um uh, and it was it was something i saw over and over again when we were doing the events is uh, there's a story in the book that was in one of the early issues about assisting a friend's suicide. The friend was dying of AIDS and, you know, there, there was not going to be any cure. There was no way out of the situation, but the, the men that were involved in nursing him at the end, you know, kept finding things funny, kept finding these, these black humor situations And when the author read that piece live for the first time, you know, the audience was super uncomfortable because it was funny. And uh, he had to stop at one point and say, look, no, it's okay. We laughed at the time. You can laugh now. And it was it was like a dam broke. People had so such a good time during that reading, you know, even though it's this horrible, dark situation that you know you'd hope that never be in the way it's told was really funny and that kept coming up again and again in the magazine and then in the book where you know yeah you have to laugh right because otherwise you're going to cry and that won't do you any good you you know you have to survive the situation and so i think that came up with um with the title too is that you know it 
it helps. It really helps sometimes to to acknowledge that yes, there's a lot of pain and darkness in the world. But you know, then the sunny days come along, and there's really nothing better than you know, bird song and smelling the flowers and you know, looking at the blue sky. Uh, you know, I I really feel, and it's it's kind of a thread through all my work is that every day above ground is a good day. It doesn't matter how how bleak and how dark it is you're still alive and there's still hope and you know things must get better yeah yeah i i I, well put and 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 thank you for for your answer on that because i believe it's i don't know i've always like i said i've always been attracted to to the wonderful title and my my experience of this too and just to 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 mention is that those type of stories, I encountered them actively. The only time in my life was within rehabilitation from from alcohol addiction. Right. So like I mm-hmm. go to rehab and those stories are just so like they're, they're darkly like funny and wild and, and sad of like just wild behavior, you know, related to addiction. And then like, you know. You know, the the person who's telling the story starts laughing because it's so crazy, the situation. Everybody starts laughing and gosh, we all felt better. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, at that point you've survived. It's been horrific, but you're on the other side of it. And, you know, there's there's a a real power to being able to tell your story. I don't think that's encouraged enough, you know, to just be completely honest and and tell your truth. You know, because that's the way that we we see each other, right? That's the way we recognize ourselves and somebody else by hearing what's happened to them. I I, I appreciate your comments there. It's actually been a, something I've been really, really deeply interested about, like the level of honesty and what you share uh, in writing and the level of courage um, that that really takes. So um, this is is very timely conversation uh, for me. Another piece I wanted to ask you about, uh, Lauren is um, I had a guest, Alan C., uh, Allison C. Meyer, uh, who does some cemetery tours. I love and, her work. And, oh, my gosh. She is just so wonderful. Thank you. Yeah, it's great to have now having both of you on here. But um, so she does uh, she does that. She um, I encountered an article that she had written about Egon Schiele, the uh, Austrian painter who had an unfinished painting and him and his family had died during the pandemic like a hundred years ago. Uh, she had, pu- you know, she had published this article, I think it was like last fall. And I happened upon it, obviously given our current situation and, uh, had her on and she does a lot of, you know, uh, cemetery travel and tours And I, prior to reading like some of her stuff and reading some of your things, it was like, if I I've been down in you know Savannah and graveyards down there and just looking around wondering what I'm doing, and if you walk around in a cemetery and you you don't know that it's okay to do, it, 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 can you tell us can you tell us about your work there and what type of you know like history that people encounter and uh, your interest in cemetery travel. Uh, could you oh. speak to that? Oh my goodness. How long have you got? <laughs> <laughs> well, right. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Um, Go ahead. Uh, well, I, I started in cemeteries by accident, you know, blundered into it pretty much the way I run my entire life. But, um, when my husband and I went to England the first time, we, we didn't intend to go to England at all. We were on our way to Spain and uh, the first Gulf War was kind of unfurling as that happened. And so, you know, security was really tight getting into the San Francisco airport. And by the time we got on the first plane, we'd missed the connection to the second plane. So we landed in New York and, you know, had no idea how we were going to get to Spain and the woman said, oh, there's a plane going to England. You could catch a plane to Spain from there. Run. So we ran through the airport, got, jumped on this plane, and uh, they didn't have any seats for us. So they put us in first class. The only time in my life I've flown first class. It was free. 
<laughs> Yay! The, yeah, Good for you. Good story. By, yeah, and by the time we um, were flying across the ocean, the U.S. started to bomb Baghdad. So we landed in England. We didn't have any British money or guidebooks or place to stay, any plans. But we thought, you know, it's probably safer to stay in a country where we speak the language than to go to Barcelona, where, you know, my husband speaks some Spanish, but we weren't sure how different Catalan would be. So, okay, well, we'll just stay in England. And, you know, I've been reading about England my whole life. Fine, we can find things to do. But um, one day we were in the bookstore in Victoria Station, and there was a collection of photographs, just this luminous, luminous black and white book of photos of Highgate Cemetery. And uh, Highgate had been, uh, it was founded in the Victorian area. And so it was uh, at one point, you know, very lush and very posh and all of that. But after World War One and the first pandemic and then after World War II, you know, families had died out. There were lots of graves that just weren't being kept up anymore and not not much money coming in for new graves for upkeep. And so the cemetery started to fall apart and started to get overgrown and was in worse and worse shape. And uh, let's see, it's Taste the Blood of Dracula was filmed there, one of the Hammer Horror movies. So then there were all these stories about people had seen a figure in black roaming around the cemetery, and um, that led to rumors about ghosts and vampires. And there were two guys who had kind of a magical battle going on who were hunting vampires in the cemetery and breaking open tombs and staking bodies and, and you know, just thoroughly out of control. And all of this is true, right? I'm not making this up. This is true stuff. So um, the friends of the cemetery stepped up and took it over, locked the gates, started giving tours, started raising money to uh, restore the cemetery. And that's where this book came in. The, these were photographs of the cemetery before the restoration had started to take place. And so my husband and I were talking about, well, what are we going to do? We're in England for a few more days. And he decided that, you know, this cemetery is not going to be in this romantic disarray for long. They're going to fix it up. And so it's going to look boring like every other cemetery. We should go and see it now. So we went one January day. We were the only people in the cemetery except one of the gardeners was working. And he let us in and, you know, said, well, if you're interested, Karl Marx is buried down this way. I'm not saying you are interested, but if you are interested, that's where he is. And uh, then turned us loose. And we just roamed around in this amazing place that was you know, full of statues of angels. You know, every time you turned around, there'd be another angel. And the ivy had grown over her. And all you could see was her face or just a hand pointing toward heaven. And it was amazing. I had never been any place like that. And I thought, you know this is really kind of cool that this is just here. It's, you know, you walk in and look at it and it's one of a kind pieces of art and, you know, all these stories and these beautiful epitaphs. And even though it was January, there were flowers starting to bloom. You know, it, it was sad and wonderful and really beautiful. And uh, then the next half of our trip was we went to Paris where a friend had said, you know, you really need to go see Père Lachaise. So we didn't really know what we were in for. It seemed a little weird to go to a cemetery, but, you know, we'd already been to the one in England. Maybe the one in Paris wouldn't be too strange. And Right, right, but, right. Yeah, yeah Père Lachaise is huge. You know, it's enormous. And somebody had gone through and chalked Jim and an arrow on tombs all over the cemetery and if you followed all the arrows, eventually it led you to Jim Morrison's grave. Uh. And <laughs> it was amazing. You know, and again, it was January. We were about the only people in the cemetery. And, uh, you know, we managed to stumble across Oscar Wilde's grave. And, 
Edith Piaf and Moliere and all these wonderful people that are buried there. And and I got hooked, you know, I'm like, all right, that's it. Now I've seen two cemeteries. Uh, we just had to keep seeing cemeteries. You know, and at first it was like, well, we'd go someplace and we'd kind of run into a cemetery. Though, you know, we're in Prague, I guess we should go look at a cemetery here. But then it got to the point where I was like, yeah, all right, going to Portland. Portland has a cemetery. I should go see the cemetery there. You know? <laughs> right, right. And, and- and, you know, people are buried everywhere. So now it's like, well, what haven't I seen? I've been to um, Highgate, and it might have been a little bit after, y- y- a few years after you were there. I think it was 97, yeah. uh, to my recall. Yeah, and um, I it's remember It's still Marx's, pretty overgrown and crumbling. Is it? Yeah, yeah. And uh, I remember Marx's grave is very huge. And interesting as for philosophers is that I believe it's Herbert Spencer. I believe I have the first name right. Spencer was kind of like the social Darwinist opposite of Karl Marx and uh, buried right across from Marx. So there's even this like strange ideological like opposition um, that is because he's right across from Marx's grave. But um, and I've always wanted to see Morrison's. Grave. I'm a huge Doors fan and Jim Morrison. And uh, that that must have been. That must have been fantastic. So I definitely see how you kind of happened upon this type of travel, right? Yeah, well, it was just totally by accident. But, you know, it's gotten to the point now where, you know, once you start to learn a little bit about the history and the iconography and all of that, you can learn a lot just from standing in front of somebody's grave. And I love all the stories that, you know, not just the famous people, but the not famous people who's who's names would probably be lost except for they have this beautiful gravestone or this, you know, wonderfully sad epitaph or something like that. Right. Um, yeah. And and thank you for that. I was, I was actually quite interested in how, you know, how you, you, how that developed. And in talking to you, I, I, I realized that, uh, even though I haven't formalized that type of travel where I've gone, you know, I've been to Prague cemetery, Mm -hmm and the Jewish cemetery in, in Highgate and have found myself strolling along when I've been in, in other areas. So, um, you know, and I've, I've, I've picked up a particular fascination in habit of walking over the last few months since, um, uh, since the pan- pandemic, I've just walked a lot and, mm-hmm. and finding myself, you know, more available to be running into, into places. Um, Right now, uh, a question kind of connected to, you know, the work that you do as an artist and things that you create. Do you have any thoughts on, you know, the role of art um, now, you know, amid, amongst amongst the pandemic, uh, just as far as, you know, what 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 is what is the, the role? I mean, it, is it more to distract? Is it more to delve some of the social uh, issues that we have? Is art's role generally the same, but you kind of have to consider different questions? Do you have some general thoughts about, you know, the role of art right now in our times, you know, August 2020 uh, with uh, within a pandemic? Do you have any thoughts about that? I, I think it's art's role is pretty much the same always, you know, just to remind us that beauty is fleeting and therefore it's important to appreciate it when you come across it. Um, to underline the importance of honesty, to to encourage us to love. I mean, I, I really do think that uh, it's easy to, like, let yourself be overwhelmed by just, the, you know, the daily day uh, worrying about work and worrying about rent and worrying about food and, you know... <sighs> It fills the days and makes them pass, but I don't think that's what's important. You know, what's important is the way the sunlight comes in through a prism or the smell of the breeze when it blows off the ocean or listening to the birds sing first thing in the morning. You know, what's important is eternal and all this bullshit about daily stuff, you know, 
cleaning the kitchen and doing the laundry and all of that is not important. That, that's, it's too easy to waste our time on those things. And I, I, when it's done well, I think art makes us stop and catch our breath and, you know, feel alive. And, and I think that's more necessary than ever in the midst of all the lockdown and the pandemic. I mean, I've been locked in my house. Yesterday was 180 days. And my kid has a chronic illness. And so we have to be really careful not to expose her to anything. And so I've seen one friend in the last six months. I saw him on the street corner because I bought a painting from him for my husband for his birthday. And, you know, it was wonderful to have a conversation with somebody, sure, even though sure. all I could see were his eyes above his mask. But... You know, we couldn't hug each other or, you know, it really put in perspective what is important and when the world goes back to normal or as normal as it ever goes back to, you know, it's going to be really crucial to, to hug people and to tell them how important they are to you. I, I definitely, I definitely uh, know that and, um, you know, I, I appreciate your comments there. It's, it's something I think that a lot of a lot of people are feeling to some, you know, some level and some degree, everybody's ex experiencing is, is experiencing that. So during that, during this time, I, I wanted just to kind of geek out a tiny bit here on, you know, you get a new collection coming now called Un unsafe words. Um, I, uh, I, I, I love uh, science fiction and horror. I, adore Ursula again. I love Octavia Butler probably above everybody else because it's kind of science fiction and horror and pretty darn brilliant to me. <laughs> Those are the things I love. She's amazing. But, yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I'd happy to hear any comments you have uh, on, you know, any science fiction authors that, you know, influence you. But um, could could you chat a little bit about uh, your 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 collection that's coming out, and maybe a little bit about science fiction and horror and what sure. it means to you? Yeah. Um. Yeah. Well, the the collection is it's fifteen short stories. They vary from straight up horror to some of them are are not. They don't have any genre elements in in them at all. Um, they're just about real life and how real life can be horrific sometimes. Um, and there's some science fiction. There's a fairy tale. There's a couple of fantasy stories. So it's a little bit of everything. Um, one of the the people I I asked for a blurb described it as a kaleidoscope, which I thought was a really beautiful image that. You know, you turn it and one way you're looking at skulls and then you turn it a little bit more and they're actually flowers. And, you know, the I think the stories comment on each other uh, just because they're from such different traditions, right? The tradition of science fiction and the tradition of horror. But to me, it's all... It's like a pond where you skate from one side to another. They're all interlinked, and, and the genres aren't as separate as people would like them to be, I think, um, not just in my work, but in, in the real world. Uh, yeah, I'm really excited to to get it out and see what people think of it once it's it's out there. I mean, they've been published. Most of them have been published before. There's a, one new story to the collection, but... You know, they were in cemetery dance and space and time and all kinds of different places. So, yeah, I, I, it's going to be fun to have it out in the world. And yeah, in terms of science fiction, I don't know. Have you read um, Ancillary Mercy and Lucky's? It was the first I of have the trilogy. not. I have not. It's it's brilliant in about six different ways. But one of the things I like about it is. Um, they carry basically zombie soldiers around in the ship, in the in the belly of the ship. And then when they land on a planet, they thaw the soldiers out. And the ship can inhabit each of the bodies and shift from person to person to person. So that all the soldiers have the same personality, which 
is the, the computer on the ship. But they see each other and interact with each other, and it's just brilliant. And, you know, and, and horror, too, at a certain level, that these are basically dead people with no consciousness of their own that are being inhabited by this computer. And, you know, so it, it is science fiction, but it's still pretty horrific. And, and I just love that. I, I love to find books like that, that, you know, it, it looks like space opera, but it's really dark underneath. And, uh, you know, I, I'm a big Star Wars nerd. But to me, one of the beauties of Star Wars is that that universe is really dark. There's slavery and, you know, soldiers that are stolen from their families as children, both as, you know, Jedi and as stormtroopers, and raised up in an ideology that they never have an opportunity to question. And, and that's pretty grim. But, you know, then there are lasers and laser swords and you know, yeah, well, and, and I, 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 no, I think you're absolutely right. I think, I think there's something. I'm mean, just on this point. I think there's sometimes within genres when you see another one kind of crawl in and become what the movie is. But there's something in your head you're saying, well, it's not that. I'll give you an example. Like for me, I was watching The Rise of Skywalker and Star Wars, and I'm like, I think this is a horror movie. Like you yes. know, I mean, you're you're, you're in its categories. Hard. Right in the Revenge of the Sith, you're like this overall, as far as a dominant motif, <laughs> seems to be horror. <laughs> and uh, I think it's interesting, you know, as you know, like where you're kind of moving back and forth, and um, you know the where the categories break down or where there's the ambiguity. That's where the a lot of the fun stuff is, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. What I wanted to uh, and and so in in that um, unsafe words is is that could do you have a date a release date for that one that's coming out? I'm aiming for the end of September. I don't have an actual date yet. It's all kind of attendant on the cover, which is in the process now, but I haven't seen it yet. So I can't put the book up for pre-order until I have the cover, and that's that's where we are at the moment. So it's okay. getting very close. Oh, wonderful. That's that's that that's great to hear. Uh, big, 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 big question, Lauren. Why is there something rather than nothing? Oh, my goodness. Why is there something? Um, I, I sort of feel like we are an accident of the universe, kind of out of its generosity. Here we are, and it's pure luck. And that gift is what makes everything wonderful and perfect you know the fact that we're alive is amazing the fact that i was alive and got to see david bowie on stage there my life is set so uh, i think that there's something because we're given this gift and we have to repay it somehow does that make sense it it sure it, it it sure does, and I also connect to your Bowie reference. Uh, I'm lucky. <laughs> I'm lucky enough, and I mean, we all we all know it deep down within our heart that that is a special thing to have experienced. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I I love that. Um, and uh, of course, we're ch chatting with uh, Lauren Rhodes, and um, towards the end here, Lauren, I I wanted to just open it up for you uh, to kind of lay out and, and guide the listeners because I enjoy the the universe of things that you create and you know whether it's the um, graveyards or whether it's morbid curiosity or whether it's you know your science fiction and, and fiction and horror writing how do where do people look for your for your stuff how do they connect with you anything along those lines so um, our listeners can, kind of follow up on a lot of these great threads well my my homepage is laurenrhodes.com and my name is spelled kind of weird so maybe you can put it in the show notes or something like that <laughs> yeah um, yeah and and that's pretty much the heart of everything that links to my facebook and my twitter and instagram and all that jazz um my cemetery work 
for the most part is centered on cemeterytravel.com. And uh, some days I'm better about updating that than others. But it's kind of the record of my fascinations. Uh, one of the books I've been working on sort of long term is uh, uh, exploring the Bay Area's pioneer cemeteries. Because San Francisco is really a young city, you know, compared to like Rome or London or something like that. It, we've only been here since 1776. And so um, even though that isn't a very long span of time, there are these little pocket graveyards everywhere that date back, you know, only to the gold rush or something like that, where you know, each little town around here had its own industry. And so there's a Portuguese fisherman cemetery and a Welsh mining cemetery and a, uh, loggers in the Santa Cruz Mountains. Uh, there's a guy who's buried down in San Jose who ran into a grizzly bear and the bear swiped him across the head and misshaped his skull i'm not sure i'm using the word the verb right but um his his head was misshapen for the rest of his life and so he wore a hat and um his name was mountain charlie and you know that wasn't that long ago that there were grizzly bears running around here but you know now it's all silicon valley and and all of that so anyway my uh, my cemetery explorations are on cemetery travel, and that's where I'm looking into all these weird little stories of, of people who are are not with us but should be remembered. Yeah, and 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 thank you so much for for sharing that. And I very much look forward to your new book. And yeah, and thanks for mentioning San Francisco too. It's a a city I love, and obviously, like you said, younger. Um, uh, quite complicated. And I was, I got to tell you, like, I love San Francisco. I was super excited. Um, uh, I, I sold a, a painting to a good friends of mine. It's actually going to be uh, in on hate street. And I was like, wow, that's some like really good cred. Like I'm a hate actor. That is very cool. <laughs> so I was excited. And I always, you know, having some friends down there and, and you bringing it up, it, it's nice to connect. And I, I love how you described like, you know, the wild aspects of San Francisco, because people think about modern wild, right? But I think you point to, you know, those crazy stories of being on the bay, of the exploration, of the kind of tough jobs, tough, dangerous yeah. jobs, and, you know, that kind of like labor, you know, I'm a labor union guy, I, I work for a labor union, but like the history of work in that area, it's a very vibrant uh, area, transforming rapidly as, you know, yeah, well, as, and, as, and now, now transforming again, it's it it will be interesting to see, you know, what survives the pandemic. And, you know, if rents drop and artists come back, it, this could be a whole different place in another year or two. Yeah, I guess like like everything right now, we're going to kind of stay tuned. Right. <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> um. Uh, Lauren Rhodes, uh, Lauren, uh, personally, uh, professionally, thank you so much for spending time, um, on the something rather than nothing podcast. Uh, you know, I, I reached out to you and it was great to, 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 to be able to collaborate with you. Um, I've been, you know, just kind of following and been just, just so curious and interested for, you know, years about what you write and what you encounter. I just wanted to thank you for the art that you've created and very much looking forward to, um, the, uh, the, the, the new collection in unsafe words. So, um, just wanted to express my deep pleasure in having you, uh, on the show, Lauren Rhodes. Thank you so much for this. This was really wonderful. Thank you. And um, uh, appreciate your time. And hopefully we'll talk again soon. I'd like that. All right. Bye, Lauren. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. You are listening to Something Rather Than Nothing.